nine. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only nine Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, and 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. Members will also gain access to our private Facebook group community, weekly and monthly Patreon supporter giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only nine Patreon supporters away from this next major milestone. Check out the link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we are heading back down to you know Southern Virginia with uh, Colin Bennett. Dude, it's been a while. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, man. Hope you are. I've I've been hanging in there. It's been a crazy, crazy spring so far. Tons of fishing. Uh, and we were talking, you know, before we got started here, just with, you know, I'm having some mechanical boat problems when I'm fishing boat tournaments. I just got a torpedo on my kayak because I'm really realized maybe I should just diversify my portfolio just for the winning aspect of it and see what happens. Um, but when it comes to fishing, like what have you been up to? Well, I've been I've been pretty hot and heavy into the BFLs, you know, the past past two months. Um, we're getting up on night fishing season now, so pretty excited for that combined with the rest of the BFL season. It's it's a lot of fishing from now until July pretty much. So just getting ready. Besides the BFLs, um what lakes are you primarily fishing right now? Right now I'm going to Smith pretty much once a week and uh the night tournaments up at field pot are going to be starting soon so it'll be you know i'd say on average field pot and smith every other week that's insane where do you live i don't think in the last podcast i actually asked you a very off basic question like <laughs> I, in between field pot kerr and and smith yeah so i live in danville uh it's pretty much I know that area. Yeah, if, if you if you put Phil Pot, you know, right there, and then Smith right there, and then Bugs is down here, I'm I'm right smack in the middle of all three, pretty much. Dude, that's awesome. That's like the perfect place to be. Oh, and it's a lot of other smaller, you know, smaller lakes around too. I'm like an hour from Blues in North Carolina, which is like a spotted bass lake, and then Heiko and Mayo are really close. Uh, I ain't but two and a half hours from the James River. It's a good good location i mean so with all that said i mean let's just i guess first recap kind of like your, your tournament season wise um and i think if i'm not mistaken we start at uh smith mountain lake so i mean really that tournament it was raining cats and dogs doesn't do it justice for just how <laughs> there are some days where i truly think it's not worth the money and it's like whether it's like on the upper bay where it's like it's four foot waves and it's like no, it's not hundred thousand dollars. I don't do it. Or when it's raining so much and it's cold and it's like, what the hell am I doing out here? And that was one of those days. <laughs> one of those days that makes you want to sell all your stuff and start crappy fishing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so how did it go for you? It it went okay. I I didn't get paid, so it didn't get it didn't go but so good. But I ended up. I think I came like twenty fourth. Um, I had like 14 change. It's nothing crazy, but you know, I had the bites. I just wasn't able to, to capitalize on them. Um, you know, I started out in, in one area. It's just a single Creek on the lake and spent about 30 minutes in there and had two keepers in the boat off at one spot, just scoping with a, you know, the old guys will, will kill me because of this, but just catching them scoping on a little jig head minnow. And then, uh, that's left no out of there. With, there. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. But uh, I left out of that one area and went and fished around on the Blackwater side some. I think I caught one or two keepers on the Blackwater side. Maybe one came like on a jerkbait. 
but I think I ended up calling him out and then went and fished around the mouth of the Roanoke and just running at, you know, I'd gotten on the fish like in the backs of, of live creeks and ran into the back of this one creek and uh, hooked into a big one and he come up and spit the hook and ran the next creek up, did the same thing, ended up having a limit for, you know, 14, low 14s. But dude, like you did a top 30 out of over 100 boats. That's that's pretty good, honestly. And I think that's the hard thing with this just as fishing is what is success? Is it just winning or nothing else? Because if that's the case, that's depressing as hell because you were what? If there was 100 boats, you were in the top 20 percent of the field. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I have more of a realistic view on it a lot of people they want you know they're happy with making regionals placing top 45 and you know your first year as a boater or whatever that's great but i'm kind of at the point like i just want fishing to pay for fishing if i can if i can do what i love to do and not have to worry about it being a big expense out of my regular income then i have nothing else to ask for yeah and that's really hard with like the, the bfls right now but again, it's like, it's a good start to the season. It really is. It's better than finishing 60th because at least you have this moral victory. But you, you, yeah, move, that's on, right. you move on to your next event. And where does that take you? Uh, as far as BFLs goes, I hopped in a North Carolina division at Bugs almost as kind of like a practice run for the Piedmont. And uh, I had like four for nine. Uh, fish I didn't practice any for it I put in and and fished around in nut bush all day the wind was supposed to be really bad and I just won't try to break nothing and uh ended up just getting on a little a little deal that I figured out a little too late and had four you know decent sized fish for almost 10 pounds I guess that kind of puts you like what middle of the pack then for Kerr yeah it was you know, the crazy thing about bugs, I guess it's it's kind of similar to your home pond up on the Potomac. You know, it 16 will win and 14 is the last spot to get you a check. You mm -hmm. know, it's very tight weight. Um, and that's just, you know, catching that one four pound class fish at, on a lake like bugs really changes your day for you. It, it reminds me, I remember... I don't know if it was Polonix series or whatever. It was one of the, the big time angler series and they were at Lake Champlain. And he talked about how you're not just looking for a three pound smallmouth. You're looking for like a three pound, two ounce smallmouth. And that literally, that little difference will determine a check versus not a check. And it, it was so interesting seeing him in practice weighing all the damn fish because he was trying to find a pattern like, okay, these are just a little heavier. And but that's kind of what you got to do almost on like a cur place. You you got to find, even if it's just a couple of freaking ounces, it makes a big difference there. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I think the biggest thing about bugs is like region of the lake that you're fishing. You know, it, you can, you can get on a, I don't know, let's say you're, you're throwing a spinner bait on Rocky points. Well, you can be hammering them all over the lake, but you can be fishing up grassy Creek on that pattern and be catching two and a quarter pounders and then move down uh, five miles down the lake to Ivy Hill and be catching two and a half pounders. And that'll be the difference between you getting a check and you coming in 60th. It, it really is. And to me, that's interesting. And why is it Kerr is so spinnerbait synonymous? I had Chaz on earlier this year and he threw a spinnerbait. SB throws a spinnerbait. Everyone and their mother throws a damn, but it works. Why does it work there so well? Well, I think the biggest thing is just bugs is never truly clear. You know, I'm used to mm. fishing Smith and Phil pot where you can see if you're sitting in eight foot of water, you can see the bottom. Um, whereas bugs, it's never like that. It's always, you know, two, three, four foot at most visibility. Um, I would say that combined with, for whatever reason, I have found that a lot of fish, not all the fish, but a lot of fish on that lake like to go shallow. I don't mean they live shallow, 
That just means when you got a trend of rising water on that lake, they like to go shallow if they can. I heard something really cool the other day, which was, and I really wish I could name it to the guest I had on, but like a foot deep is plenty for a bass because a fish is not a foot wide. So a six pounder is not a foot wide. And so, yeah, exactly. And he's like, you'll be surprised in some of these docks. And he was talking about docks specifically, like super shallow docks can still hold a four pounder. When yep. you mean shallow, like, are you talking 10 feet or shallower, an inch, like just an average? I take it lake by lake. I mean, shallow for me on field pot is 15 or less, but shallow for me <laughs> on bugs is five foot or less. That's insane, dude. Oh yeah. So it's, it's a case by case thing. Does it give you a disadvantage or an advantage when you fish a lot of field pot and Smith that are generally clearer and you're fishing offshore going to occur that is a little bit dirtier? <laughs> Depends on what the fish is biting, man. <laughs> if if I can find fish, if I can find higher quality fish in the clear water and catch them out a little bit, you know, a little bit deeper, I know that my chances are going to be better because those are my strengths. That's that's what I feel like I'm best at doing is fishing out deeper with a drop shot and a, a Domeki rig, things like that. Um, I'm more confident in that type of fishing. Um, it's just up to the fish as to whether they want to cooperate. Um, with that being said, though, you know, I still I don't mind going up in the dirt, as as they say in Carolina. Um, if I can find a good you know population of fish that are up shallow that I think are, are fish that are going to get me a check or get me a win, you know, I'm not going to be hard headed and and try to make deep fish bite that aren't there when I know that it's winning fish up shallow, you know. And that's a hard thing, too, is like, how much do you like to force your strengths? I like to force them as much as I can in practice, but I'm not going to, if I'm practicing on a Friday in a tournament on a Saturday, I'm not going to give more than two or three hours in a day fishing what I like to fish until I go pull the plug and do something different. Wow. That's insane. Well, that's yeah, just if I were to quantify it, you know. It's just interesting because like I know like you go like with a like a John Cox person and it's like ride or die, they're doing one thing. And I think that's hard because I think people have known on this show that I've talked about a swim jig probably too much because I just I feel confident with it, but then it also hurts me because I fished a chatterbait like four times in my life because I'm retarded. It, because I just have these things that I fall back on that this is my confidence, and that's a bait. But then you also have styles and and, and methods of fishing too. And I've always found that fascinating where you get people that fish gin clear deep places, but then you take them to the bayou and they're like, shit, what do I like? This is completely out of my comfort zone. And um, talking about uh, Mr. Donaldson, who his episode is going to drop here guys in a couple of weeks, you know, he went up to the title of Potomac and he said like, you know, I'm a Carolina boy. Like I got the shakes almost when I went there for the first time. Cause you're like, you're just camping on a grass bed. And it's like, it's, it's weird. But to me, it's like, that's, that's a Tuesday. That's what you do. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. What's the hardest thing for you adjusting to Kerr? You know, it's, it's not so much as an adjustment as it is just, I have a mentality that I pull up to the ramp at Phil Pot Smith. And then I have a mentality that I have when I pull up at Bugs. It's, I, I when I'm driving in the truck on the way to both places, I'm thinking differently, you know, where at, at Phil Pot and Smith, the first places I'm going to try is a little bit deeper, finessier presentation, deeper water. Whereas at Bugs, the first thing I'm going to go do is try to find fish in the bushes and try to find fish that are up shallow. Um, as far as the hardest part about adjusting, I would, that's, that's a tough question, man. <laughs> um, I don't know. It takes a lot of time to respool all my 10 pound test to 16 pound. <laughs> Dude, I, know that, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting up um, for a, no, I'm it's, it's fun. It, it is. And it, I just have always found that interesting. Like this, this style differences, um, especially with, with Kerr and a place that you're trying to get more, you're trying to get more reps in there and try to become 
more of a, a professional at fishing that place, which is smart because all regions go through Kerr, all big tournaments go through that place. And it's a very smart mindset to oh, have to, to do that. Did I lose you? Nope. I'm still here. Oh, might have to cut this part. I don't know. <laughs> nope. I'm doing that right now. Minute point two two. All right. Perfect. So, uh, just to recap what I said, all tournaments that are big go through Kerr, regional, state, everything. So it's really smart that you're doing what you're doing by trying to get, you're getting your teeth busted now, but it'll pay off big time in the long run. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've scanned a lot of water at bugs, especially on the lower end. Um, fish that can see further out in front of them are going to be prone to living in deeper water for most months of the year, you know, except for the spawning months. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've run into at bugs is just, you know, the brush piles are huge and the, the structure aspect of it is, is a big deal, but it's just as big of a deal in my opinion to drop the trolling motor and fish through a Creek and try to find the little intricacies that are put, you know, throughout that Creek, whether it's a bush that sticks out a little further than the rest of them or a single isolated pile of rock that's three foot off the bank. You know, those things that bugs are, are way more important than they are at a place like Philpot because the whole lake is straight down rock. You know, it, you don't have to go far to find it. Why do you think that is? Bugs sit flatter. Speculate. Interesting. Yeah, bugs sit flatter. It's not a mountain lake. Damn, dude, you're blowing my mind right now. I didn't even think of that. Huh. <laughs> You're right. You're right, though. Like Smith or a Clater Lake, which is more of like a it's a ravine that they just dammed up. Um, huh. Yeah. And there's not a lot of stuff in Kerr, relatively speaking, compared to some lakes. Um, when it comes to like when you're graphing, it's not a forest down there everywhere. No, I mean, most of the stuff that people find at bugs is is introduced by man. It's nothing natural. Um granted you know you got that stuff you see with your eyeballs like i said that bush that sticks out a little bit further than the rest of them but as far as those brush piles and those little rock piles whatever most of them now rock piles not as much but most of them are dropped in by some dude whereas at smith you get out in the main channel and it's standing timber that the corps of engineer left when they built the lake it's a little different <laughs> it, it is and you always wonder like if they left more wood in there like a lake hartwell for an example they left a lot of standing timber like if that would have made it better so to speak but it is what it is and it just makes it so much if you find something different there it's so much bigger than a lake that probably has like all flooded timber it's just so much more important to find those little little things those little differences how disciplined are you or how much do you want to get more disciplined with just sitting behind your, your console, listening to a podcast and just graphing for eight hours? It's kind of like I'm trying to quit smoking. <laughs> I've been, uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm kind of taking a multifaceted approach. I've been, you know, I was raised up on just go down the bank, drop a trolling motor and try to find an area that's got fish in it. Um, with that being said, here recently, aside from the spawning months, I'm at the point now, I'm if I'm fishing for eight hours straight, I'm trying to graph for six and fish for two. Now, it was the other way around. I fished for six and graph for two. I'm just kind of trying to stagger my, my my seat time out a little bit more because hmm. it's, it's very difficult to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it is. It is. And, and I don't know. It's... I think it works though. I just, I do. It's just so hard to have that discipline to just go out there and just graph. Well, and man, I, the thing about you know, it, I, I know it works, but I know that there's always going to be a population of shallow fish. You know, it's always fish to be found shallow in the lakes that aren't deep, clear bodies of water. And that, that's that thought that always pulls at the back of my mind that I still haven't been able to kick out fully yet. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, it's a bell curve where 
if you've never been to a lake before, it probably is really important for you to spend two days just graphing. But when you've, and, and we'll get into like the night fishing at Smith, but when you've been to Smith for the 2000th time, how much more graphing do you actually have to do to find new stuff? Right. Eventually, I think that these guys, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a stud on Smith or anything like that, but I think that the guys that are, I think they've got their rotation of spots. You know, they've got their 1,500 waypoints or whatever, and they pick which one to start on depending mm -hmm. on what the wind is supposed to do and what the weather's supposed to do. And they let that dictate what spots they run for the day, you know, depending on the conditions. And that's something that's interesting to me as a sadly a tidal river guy, just with my history where you just pick a Creek, generally speaking, that has fish and like, okay, it's mad woman. You're in mad woman and you figure out the mad woman. That sometimes works on lakes like a Smith or a curb, but a lot of times also it's, did you rotate your points or your brush piles correctly? And I just feel like there's more gambling, maybe gambling. Like there's a lot more that you gotta be like, oh shit, is this the right one out of the 300 I'm gonna run today? Yeah. You know, when it comes to that running and gunning style of fishing, I think a lot of anglers get to a certain point where it's not gambling anymore. It's just how they fish. And I would consider myself to, to be one of those, not quite, but almost one of those people. I got the spots that I'm going to fish in a day at Smith mountain. It's, it's a few areas that I know for a fact I'm going to hit every time because more often than not, I catch fish quality fish off of them. Um, I'm just, I feel like I'm not quite at that point yet where I can say, I know big, big fish hang out on these 300 mm -hmm. waypoints, depending on a north, south, east, west wind, a cold yeah. front, a warm front, whatever. That takes time. And that's, that really you know, does. that's what those guys have figured out. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, I was like, agreeing with you. Like, yeah, like, and that's, that's time, you know, it, it, it takes time to get there, but. I feel like each time you're on a lake, you narrow it down a little bit more and a little bit more to where there's not as much of a learning curve. And what place do you think, and maybe it's already curb, we already talked about it. Which place do you think has the highest learning curve? Is it Philpot, Smith, Curb, the Potomac? Like where do you do you use like this one is a little bit harder to learn? If you grow up where I grow up, uh, tidal waters definitely is the the biggest learning curve. Crazy. Um, I've, you know, the Potomac is is a different beast from the James, just in mm -hmm. the sense that, I, from what I understand, a lot of guys at the Potomac just drop the trolling motor and spend eight hours in one creek and just throw a chatterbait all day. Uh, the James is a little different, where you know there is an aspect of running the tide a little bit more. Uh, throw in some some more conventional baits as far as, you know, what you would throw on your typical man-made reservoir. But I definitely think that tidal water in this area is the biggest learning curve if you're not, if you haven't grown up on it. It's interesting because I would say the, the hardest thing for me is fishing docks. It's, there you go. I don't, I, and I don't know why. I think it's because the Potomac's got six of them, but. It's also the fact that if you told me that there's like grass, a mile of grass, that does not scare me as much as if you say there's a mile of docks, you got to figure it out. I'd be like, fuck, yeah. what? <laughs> this is going to suck. Well, and you know, day. That's, that's the thing about it. it it's a hundred percent regional. It depends on what you grow up doing and what you get used to fishing. You know, that's, mm. that's all what it boils down to. It does. And that's what makes those anglers that are just so good that they can just switch back and forth. It just makes them so freaking deadly with yeah. going into this time of year. The biggest thing this time of year is blueback spawn, the shad spawn, bluegill spawn. I think that's all the spawns. And that's generally what you talk about in May. 
out of those three, which one do you like the most to fish or target? And which one do you hate the most to target and fish? I don't like a blueback spawn just because there's more thread fin and bluegill in the lakes around me than there are bluebacks. So a blueback spawn is harder to find for me. Um, between brim beds and a shad spawn, honestly, I'd, I'd prefer a brim bed. And that's mainly because the brim will spawn on a full moon between pretty much now and like September. It's a bite that you can kind of get on and stay on, you know, given with the nighttime conditions between now and, and the summer transition. Whereas the shad spawn, it's great while it lasts, but it ain't going to last that long. I 100% agree with you. If I had to rank them, it would be the brim bed for me is number one, blueback two, and then shad is a distant third because it's just a lotto ticket. It, it really is. Um, I don't know a lot of people that have literally game planned that their whole deal is just shad spawn every time this year and, and done have been consistent. Like you can run into it, which is nice, but it's hard to like go practice and find that. And then, Oh, it'll be there every day. A uh, 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 bluegill or, or brim. You can at least graph the damn beds. Like there's at least yeah. more of a rhyme and reason to that shit than, than a shad. Exactly. You can see the tires on your side scan. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I feel like a lot of people don't key in on that. Even now with all the information out there about it, people still don't look for that deal. Well, you know, going going back, they they spawn in my opinion, they spawn on on certain moon phases and I think that they spawn the best on a full moon. Um and they're not like shad where they push up against whatever is the greenest during the nighttime hours. And it extends on into the morning for an hour or two, you know, brim are a lot more like bass in the sense that yeah, they hang around their beds, which means that that forage stays around for the bass to eat. So that's, that's another reason I like, a, you know, if I can find brim beds and find quality fish on them, that's what I'd, like to pattern because it's a lot more patternable than everything else. Something else I'm trying to figure out, and I'm, maybe I'm going to blow this up on the show right here, is the crappie spawn because I know bass eat crappie and no one talks about that really. Maybe for good reason. I don't know. I just I don't, feel like... I don't know. Huh? At that crappie spawn, I don't... I don't know. I don't want to discredit myself on your show, but I, I don't know nothing about the crappy spawn. Oh no, no. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just cut here. I started, <laughs> I just interviewed uh, like some crappie people and it's just interesting talking about them and how bass interrelate with them. And I've always wondered about that because th it's this reason I fished so many little lakes that didn't have any shadow blue back in it, but white still worked, but they had a shit ton of white crappie. And it made my brain pop. It's like, how many times when you're fishing a brush pile, it's not shad related they're keyed in on, but it is brim and it's crappie related. And and I think we don't give a largemouth credit that they will eat bluegill and crappie. It's just always shad and blueback because Bassmaster tells us that's that's what it is. But there's like bass have no problem yeah. smoking a crappie or a bluegill at all, especially the bigger ones. That's, you know, the biggest thing that kind of makes me not think about crappy is once once they get to a certain size they're direct competitors with bass you know they they hunt for the same food mm. and i don't know i i never really really gave much thought to the crappy spawn before i've that's that's never been anything that i've anyone's ever told me about or heard of but it's I'm going to have to do some research on that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, It's more like an observation that it's like, that's the one. Sp I mean, I, I've heard people talk about the crayfish spawning the damn salamanders, but it's like, it's always like the crappie, like never get talked about. It's like, well, is that because bass don't eat them? It's like, I don't know. But anyway, it was just more of like an, like a thought I, that pops into my head while we're talking. It's yeah. No, interesting that's, to me. that's cause they're that's opportunistic as shit. Like yeah. bass will eat whatever. Um, I mean, oh, hell, yeah. Nolan minor one, two years ago on the susky because of like a cicada patch and the small mother keying in on freaking cicadas like they'll eat anything oh yeah where was i going for with this sure. shit 
I forget where I was going. Oh, yeah, with all the spawning stuff. Um, the other thing that happens this time of year, though, is I guess night fishing becomes a thing. But honestly, until we started messaging, I didn't know night fishing started so early. I always thought that was like a July, August thing. This year so far, May has been a lot tougher than April has. Uh, I started night fishing in mid-April. I don't know, probably early April at Smith Mountain. And like the first time we went out practicing for the, the first night tournament of the year, I think, you know, most of the time it's a three fish limit in the night derbs. Our, our best three went for like 14. Like it's crazy. This past weekend, hmm. it took 15 change and three fish to win at Smith in a night tournament. How do you do anything different when it comes to preparation tackle for a night do you wear night vision goggles like what do you do differently to get prepped for that oh man it's night and day difference <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go there's the dad joke of the night <laughs> yeah 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 no um at, at smith mountain in the early night fishing months it's during the daytime i don't like to fish any shallower than i can see the bottom so i'm, I'm liable to not go any shallower than, than eight foot deep. Whereas at night they'll sit in that much water because, because the shad, you know, they push up against those rocks and you just pick up a top water, a thunder stick, you know, some type of wake bait, whatever you get as close to the bank as you can, as you know, as close as your trolling motor will let you and you throw your bait even closer and uh, so start reeling it in and they'll just annihilate that bait. <laughs> that's so freaking cool. Like, so basically just power fishing galore. Oh yeah, dude. I fished, I fished this past Saturday night. Uh, we had, I don't know, four for 10, didn't get a check, but, uh, we had, we had a four and two threes and, uh, caught the two threes on, you know, within 20 feet of each other, just flipping your, your wake bait up there on the rock and hearing that dude on it. It's crazy. What do you do? Do you do anything different for your casting and stuff so you don't like just send it into a tree or a bush? Well, the one thing about Smith, it's so developed that there's a lot of artificial light. Uh, so okay. that's, you know, fill pot, I fish offshore at night a lot more. You don't want to cut your headlamp on because it can, you know, it can spook them. But uh, there's really? a lot more. Oh, yeah. Fish are finicky, man. Shit, I didn't know that. Damn. What would you do if you were sleeping in your bed and somebody cut their headlamp on right in front of your face? Uh, depending on what I took that night, I'd probably think it was the aliens that finally came. Um, honestly, <laughs> you would not be trying to kill it, most likely. <laughs> I, I'd be jumping out my window head first. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they they can be kind of sp from what I've seen, they're spooky of sudden light, but if if it's a constant light, they're acclimated to it. So if it's a shad light or a yard light or whatever, you know, as soon as it gets dark, that light is there and it stays there until the sun is back up and they have light all over the place. Uh, whereas a lightning strike might be a little different. <laughs> Anyways, fill pot, there's no docks. It's all natural. So that type of light can only be found pretty much at the boat ramps. So they tend to live out a little bit deeper. The light gives them a, a a reason to go up shallower to chase food and to eat. Hmm. Interesting. When it's okay, a, that's, that's interesting in their world and their brain, it's a natural light. You know, it's, it's there constantly when it gets dark everywhere else, it's a natural light. It's part of their environment. That blew my mind because again, I, I always recite this, like the old articles of bass masters, like, well, you know, you, you go out the night before during the shad spawn. Cause you look for the docks that has a light. But then you're like, yeah, but Smith is lit up like a Christmas tree. So does it matter it as much if a dock have a light? It helps. I think it helps. There's a, uh, from what I've found, you know, it. I haven't really done much research on it, but, you know, during the daytime at Bugs, you're looking for an isolated bush that sticks out just a little bit further from the rest of them. I haven't really seen much difference at night 
if it's a single light source that's up shallow, I tend to catch more fish off of that one single isolated light source that's on the riprap because the whole lake's riprap. I mean, it's all rock. It's just finding that rock. And I think light sources has a big difference on it as long as it's isolated. If it's a hundred yard stretch of, of rock and it's all lit up like a Christmas tree all the way through, you might not catch as many, but that's just hmm. what I found. It's those little small spots that tends to hold less quantity, but better quality. Yeah. I always figured if I had a dock on the lake like that, I would throw so many of those green lights into the water just to let it glow like a Christmas oh, yeah. tree. Um, hey, no, I've, I've had some good mornings on Smith Mountain where I would drive to some some docks that I know about that have shad lights on them. And first thing in the morning during the summertime, light them up first thing. What the hell is a shad light? Is it those green lights in the water? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay, like with okay, striper. Cool. You know, at Smith, there's a lot of striper fishermen. They'll they'll keep lights off, off the ends of their docks to where they can catch shad to go catch striper with. But that's, so that's like shad, too. That was the coolest thing ever in my life was I was down in, it was down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and they had, we went night fishing and there were a bunch of docks that had lights in the water and you just see snook and redfish and shit. And it, it was like, you could have a dock mm. with a light on it and it's not as good as those docks with a submerged light for some reason. No idea why, but it was that mm. way. Well, you know, going back to the isolated light sources versus the whole stretch of of light sources on the lake i think a lot of that too has to deal with fishing pressure and you know i could be i might not have any idea what i'm talking about and this i'll be wrong i don't know it's just what i found by fishing up there at night the single lights are not as easy to find by anglers that fish there at night therefore those areas don't get as much nighttime pressure and that's kind of the thing I feel like has something to do with why fish hang out there. Hmm. That old fellow that just, yeah. well, I mean, dude, dude goes and, and fishes at night, doesn't go off and he's going to stay up in the rocks. If he can't see the bank and the easiest way for him to see the bank is go down a bank that's lit up. Hmm. So it's, it's a lot that goes into it. It's just, it's a big difference between nighttime and daytime fishing, especially at Smith mountain. How do you organize your GPS when it comes to, let's say Smith, do you have like brush pile rock, this, this dock has a light on it and then color code that crap. Like, how do you organize that? With night fishing, I really go more off of memory just because Damn. there's not much deep fishing. So you don't have to say, okay, this brush pile is at this spot because you, I don't, me personally, I don't really fish brush piles at night. I just have my stretches of bank that I like to fish and, and that's what I run. Um, as far as daytime fishing goes, you know, I run hummingbirds and I just kind of, I got a tree icon I can flip to and I use that for a brush pile and I got a rock icon I can go to and I use that for rock piles and yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, bless Hummingbird. It's got I a like lot of great qualities, but well, Hummingbird makes you keep it simple. I mean, I run Hummingbird too, and it's like, God, I miss Lawrence sometimes just to be able to like really get nit noity with my my waypointing. <laughs> oh, the I will say the touch screen on a Lawrence is nice. My dad runs a Lawrence on his boat, and the touch screen is a big convenience, but I got to press it 17 times to get to a rock pile and I have the tree as my default setting. So I just click it 17 times whenever I hit waypoint and I'm there, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, going into like, what, what is your next tournament that you have coming up? Uh, I'm going to fish a night tournament at Smith this weekend. And then after that, I need to start going to high rock as much as I dislike that mud hole. <laughs> um, it's a BFL June 8th, I think it is down there. And I got to start at least trying to prepare for that. So that's where I'm at. High Rock is going to be interesting to see what happens with the weights there. It, it always is like one guy cracks them and then it just it fizzles out as you go down. Oh, yeah. It, take, it always takes like 22 to win and then like 12 to get a check. Mm -hmm. It is. It's so That's weird. always how it goes. 
Are you going yeah, to no, basically be targeting, generally speaking, are you going to stay shallow or stay deep? Like, what do you think your comfort zone is for that lake? I think I'm going to get two days to practice. I'm hoping to spend one day. If I can put my head down long enough, I'm going to spend one day with no rods on the deck, staring at my hummingbird for eight hours straight. It's a smaller lake, so I'm hoping that I can find some sneakier stuff doing that. And then the other day, I'm probably just going to spend trying to find some shallow population of fish somewhere. Um, and then once it, you know, once it comes up to tournament time, I'm just going to pay attention to the weather the week leading up to it. And just depending on what the weather does, I'm going to either start shallow or start deep and go from there. That's what you got to do with that place. You, I mean, it, it's such a weird place. It really is. I, I don't know. Like there is a good population of fish, but there's not. And it's, and I think it's just a fish small. It just fish is really freaking small for its size, but. All the, the lake, you know, it's 15,000 acres, I think is what it is, which is significant. You know, that's 10 grand acres smaller than, than Smith mountain. Um, lake comes up half the lake is unfishable. So, you know, conservative, well, not conservatively, you're talking about 5,000 acres you can fish on. 8,000 acres, whatever. I was not good at math. Yeah, it's it's basically the size of Lake Anna. If you cut that one, those two arms off, it's a little bit smaller than Lake Anna, and that's a small lake. But Lake Anna, I think, has way more of an offshore bite than I think than that place does. But I, I don't fish as much as I do Lake Anna. I think Anna is kind of clear, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's weird that the upper forks are dirty, but as you go down the lake, it's it's clear and clear. So by the time you get down to like the bottom one third, it's like it's it's like vodka clear. It's super super clear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that place also has a shit ton of shad and blueback and and a lot of pelagic bait. So you can run different things like that. Which is high rock. It feels like you can't because of the water color, but maybe you can. And that's just they're used to that kind of chocolate milk color. Yeah, I mean, down around the dam. I don't know. It was like two years ago, I think. It'd been dry for a while, and I'd say it was like three foot visibility. But that's the clearest I've ever seen it at High Rock, that's and that's down on the very lower end. You know, it's phew, I don't like that that's stuff, insane. man. <laughs> uh, last thing, because uh, I don't, I don't want to keep you too long here, boss. But w what would your three, what would your three baits be for night fishing if you had to pick only three? A uh, wake bait, drop shot, walking bait. A drop shot, even at night. Oh, that's what I catch them on a field pot, man. Mm. They chew Dude, a drop shot. I can't tell you how many night tournaments. Dude, I can't tell you how many night tournaments I've I've done good in at field pot off a drop shot. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh yeah. See, I would have thought that just goes jig. to show how huh. at night. Yeah, like an old jigging pig. I, I don't know if I've ever caught a night fish. I don't know if I've ever caught a night fish on a jig, ever. Really? Wow. <laughs> really? Well, you got you got more experience than I do. That's for sure. Um, a wake bait, one hundred percent. That makes sense. A walking bait, yeah. No, no, no buzz bait or like a whopper plopper or anything like that. At at fill pot, my top deck is going to be a top water, a drop shot. A Carolina rig, an old oh. monster. At Smith, it's going to be a walking bait, a wake bait, and a drop shot. That's it. Hmm. That's interesting. That's really, yeah. really cool, dude. Colin, you know, I really can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, is there any sponsors that we can promote or anyone that we can give a shout out to? Uh, just uh, Leggett Town and Country and James River Equipment. <laughs> They, if it wasn't yes. for them, I wouldn't be able to fish as much as I do. So, Act, yeah. And if you want to, uh, I think we talked all fair about that. If you want to like really pimp them out, um, what is what do they do? Uh, what do they offer? Yeah, uh, Leggett Town and Country. It's a uh, it's an apparel uh, retailer. They sell a lot of a lot of fishing, you know, clothing. We sell hook, we sell AFCO, we sell all that good stuff. Um, website for that is www.ltc2.com uh, and then james river equipment is a uh, john deere 
uh, dealership. So anytime you need a lawnmower or a tractor or whatever else, be sure to give them a shout. They got a lot of locations in Virginia, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina. There we have it, guys. As always, please go check him out. It really helps us out. Link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. If you want to, please go join us on Patreon. We are only 15 Patreon members away from hitting our next major milestone. If it really wasn't for my Patreon supporters, none of this stuff would happen, especially where we're cranking out four episodes a week. Like This would not happen without you guys. Like, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.